Ground Up Podcast. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, we do have t-shirts available on our website, but more importantly, um, our guest today already has um, t-shirts for sale that are going to fund his upcoming trip. We'll get all into that. So I'm going to post that link down below. And um, I just got mine, so I'm pumped to, um, or I just ordered mine, so I'm pumped up to get one. Cool shirts. Um, all the time you have, if you've been in the Herb community long enough, be like, shit, I wish I got that t-shirt because there's always like times that arise where they don't make that t-shirt ever again as far as, you know, like you have those, um, like I have Orient Society ones that, you know, they only print them one time and then all of a sudden you have like a cool Herp shirt from 10 years ago that no one else has that everyone is fucking impressed by and Bolins are definitely um, loved by everyone. So get you a cool shirt. And uh, Melissa was supposed to be here, but she actually got hung up on a layover flight in Atlanta, which if you don't know, Atlanta didn't have power, I guess, up until like 12 o'clock last night. So she got stuck in the airport. So it's just me. Um, last time I drank on the podcast, I was pretty much hung over for like two days. So I'm having like one nice beer during this one. So don't judge me, but I dressed like a white girl ordering a peppermint mocha at Starbucks, wearing a beanie and a North Face shirt. But I mean, I got to take it easy. I feel like I'm getting old after drinking last time. I was, yeah. But anyway, I'm just a baby. But today we have Ari, who is from um, Project Black Python. He researches Boland's Pythons. Um, Ari, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what? fascinate you about bones pythons yeah um first thanks for having me come on this is um it's always awesome to have the opportunity to talk to people especially i've never done it in this kind of a format where it's like a live video it's usually on the phone so but uh, yeah so thank you guys it's awesome um hopefully i don't bore everybody with just me rambling on and on about bones pythons because i can't i guess um I, i've been um i uh have been actively involved with um studying bones python since the late 90s I said it, uh, it probably started off more or less as just kind of an interest of something that I didn't really know much about. I guess that's how it starts with everybody. Uh, and then that slowly turned into um, nonstop research. And then it turned into from a, a like a full on infatuation, I guess. And uh, now it's an addiction, literally. So I have I have a problem. So um, and it's Boland's pythons. So. <laughs> Um, with that being said, um, I've worked with lots of different herbs and different types of taxa, different animal, I mean, mammals, birds, all sorts of fish, but, uh, I always come back to, uh, reptiles cause that's what my main love is. Um, and sometimes everybody just, you know, they'll pick a particular thing that really gets them going and it happens to be the snake. And, uh, I've just been incredibly fortunate enough to be able to, uh, work so long with them, um, travel out there uh, consecutively, uh, for the last 10 plus years. Um, and also work alongside and with um, all sorts of incredible people um, that contribute to my work daily, uh, help me uh, fund more work that I'm doing out there. And I get to meet awesome new people like you um, and uh, your uh, fan base also. So it, it just really helps out. So I've been, I've been working with reptiles for you know, over 20 years. Um, I'm at a uh, zoological facility uh, in the U.S. I've been there for over nine years, uh, close to it. So um but yeah, uh, hit me up with some questions, man. I'm I'm ready to go. So, what started you out with Bolins? At least was it a draw to where they're from naturally, maybe New Guinea, or keeping them captively, or being introduced to them in a captive setting? Uh, what got you started off? Right. So that's a great question. So initially, um, I had no idea where they were realistically from. I knew they came from New Guinea, but I didn't know anything really about New Guinea. Um, I knew headhunters lived there, and that was about it. You know, which in itself was pretty fucking badass. So that was, you know, it always in the back of my mind. Um, I, I think it really started just with the fact of uh, when I saw the first one, like in the late 90s, I was just completely captivated. I was just awestruck. It was just an incredible looking animal. And it was a big adult um, animal that had been passed around through collection to collection because nobody had any luck with it. And it was still around that time where some of the big adult animals were still being exported out. Uh, not anymore, though, which is good. And uh, the scales, the coloration, just the behavior, 
uh, everything just kind of added up and just pointed into this, you know, addiction, like I said. And uh, then I started doing more research and I found out there is no research done on it. There's virtually nothing like uh, Marzak and Ross's uh, Bows and Python reproduction book is like a Bible to me. It still is. Uh, it's one of my resources I just love. And there was like literally five or six sentences about a snake and a photo from David Tracy Barker of a young animal. And then there was an adult animal uh, that had was sitting on eggs or something. And so that was exciting right there. So I knew that they, they could breed. Um, and then uh, after that, I started looking. I saw a photo in uh, uh, the Living Snakes of the World book, which I, I know everybody has. It's a great book. And uh, I saw a photo of it in there, too. Uh, then I read Carl Switek's um, uh, manuscript on uh, Adventures in Green Tree Python Country, which is incredible. If anybody has not read it, they need to. And they go into Boland's pythons in there, too. So all these factors started leading up to we really don't know much about them. But the environment they're in is very unique. So that was also an allure. Um, and I just kind of started doing research as much as I could um, on people that have been involved with them. Uh, anybody that's touched one, uh, a photo I'd never seen, um, and and that started it. Um, and now I, I'm going on my, I can't think, thir 13th trip now um, back to the Highlands to, to see them again and, and continue doing my observations and my population surveys and all the stuff. And, then, uh, and, and, you know, with, you know, hopes of, you know, continuing this forever. I mean, uh, I've got about another 20 years, I'd say left of hiking in me. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I would say that it was just everything that put together to, to really, uh, uh, grab me, uh, to focus on this animal. So I've always been fascinated of people doing research in the field and stuff like that. I was, um, I don't know if you've read, I forget what the book's called, but I believe it's Snake Charmer about Joseph Slowinski. And he goes yeah. into, you know, Burma and Myanmar and there's a bunch of government bribing and weird stuff that happens in order to get into the country. How does, you know, how do you go from just being curious about the animal to making plans to go over there? What kind of things do you have in place when you get there? And basically, how the hell do you get to where these animals are? So, so that's another good question. So like initially, like, I had, I had traveled uh, prior to leaving. Uh, I've done like stuff in Central America. Like I've been to Costa Rica a couple of times. So I was familiar with the international travel, but I'd certainly never gone somewhere this far. So, I mean, this is, uh, it was indeed like this incredible adventure. I mean, it, every, every time it is, it's always different. It's always exciting. It's always terrifying at the same time, and rewarding. But um, I went out there initially with a friend that had been traveling there. And that was my opener. Um, and I went completely blinded as far as what I was expecting. Um, and it was climbing and hiking and sweating and pain and soreness and disappointment and excitement and everything mixed into one for like three weeks. And I came back and um, I was hooked. Like I was like, I had to go back. And uh, then I went back uh, by myself. And a lot of people said I was crazy, but I went back and I uh, met some incredible friends over there. A, a friend that I have still that I've known for 12 years who lives there and I travel with him. And, and, uh, and um, uh, then after that, it just became a routine. Uh, I had to be there. I was there twice a year, um, whether I was um, actually had my hands on a snake in the highlands. It didn't matter. I just had to be there. Uh, I had to be in the environment. I had to be around the people. I had to be everything associated to it. Um, but it, it's it's pretty scary a, a lot of times. Um, it, it's still very primitive. Um, I'm sure people get eaten still out there. I hear rumors. Um, but um, fortunately, I've met a lot of really good friends that always are excited to see when I come back and when I'm staying out in the villages and stuff like that. So I never really worry about it too much. How do you... How do you ensure your protection over there? You know, obviously a guy coming from the U.S. who probably has things that they may want or are valuable to them. Um, how do you ensure your safety? Nothing is sure for any means out there. Nothing is uh, set in stone. You can go with a mindset of something to achieve um, and you can try your hardest to do that. Um, but everything can change around it, whether it's dealing with the people, dealing with the environment, dealing with the, you know, whatever. So you've just got to go in and take it as how it presents itself to you. Um, I've been I've been very uh, comfortable traveling there now uh, for you know 
10 years plus going there. And uh, so um, I know the routine and, 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 you know, how to walk the walk and talk the talk with everybody. And, and, you know, you go there, I certainly wouldn't show up in a, a blazing red jumpsuit, you know, and <laughs> whatever, no matter how many people know me, I'm still not going to do that. American flag jumpsuit with yeah, exactly. some cut off shorts or something. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, a Flavor Flav necklace or anything like that. Uh, I wouldn't do that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, there's nothing that's set in stone. It's uh, uh, it's everything you just have to basically, the best way to do it is you take it as it comes. So uh, people who are listening to this on download can't see behind you, but it seems like these are some type of artifacts from New Guinea oh. of all these skulls and masks that looks like people have been eaten before you. Can you explain a little bit of what's going on behind uh, yeah. you? So I, um, I'm trying to get the best light I have in my house and my, and I don't have a lot of lighting in my house, but I collect a lot of artifacts from, from New Guinea. And I, I, I pride myself on uh, my collection from West Papua and all that. And it's things that I brought back over these 10 plus years. Uh, so I have a lot of uh, ancestral skulls that are behind me. Um, I it just happened to work out where it was good lighting over this way. So yeah, I've got tribal skulls that are behind me. They're real human skulls that are decorated with, uh, a different tribe, not a tribe uh, in the Highlands area that I go to, but a, a really famous tribe called the Ozma. They're the ones that reportedly, which I'm pretty confident, ate uh, the Rockefeller uh, boy. So No shit. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, – Ozma don't eat people anymore, but uh, there are other tribes out there that certainly do, I'm sure. So, But yeah, so I've got all sorts of artifacts from over there, and uh, it's just uh, – it's a, it's a home away from home. It's kind of for me, so – for most of us that don't know much about, um, you know, what kind of area, say you fly in, um, what kind of area are you going to, to find the Bolins and what's your adventure from an airport to that area? So flying direct, uh, so traveling to get to the area takes a bit, a solid three to four days of in a, like planes. Uh, it's not one stop. I mean, uh, you get into Indonesia and you get into Jakarta and, and then from there, you've got to fly over to Papua, and it takes a couple of stops to get there. You might have, you know, layovers here or there. The plane might broke, you know, be broken. You might have to get somewhere else. And then once you get into your base area where uh, the town is, then you've got to uh, hire a vehicle. You, fortunately, I have a friend that lives there at the base of the mountain area, and he owns all that. So I just give him money, and he takes me. We're back to the spot, and he's a, a, a real big help with stuff. And then that's about three to four hours to get to uh, the village. And then from the village, it's anywhere from four to seven hours uh, climbing to get to the location where they're at. And uh, then uh, you start looking for snakes. So these these animals are definitely at elevation. Do you have any idea as far as from your research, um, a range of elevation that they inhabit? Yeah. So so um, I don't know how um, uh, knowledgeable the listeners are or, or yourself with, with New Guinea. So. Uh, it's the second largest island in the world, aside from, um, I think it's Iceland, or no, Greenland, I think it is. Yeah, I think, I drank a little bit earlier too, so I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> so but um, it's uh, it's an incredible place. Um, it's politically divided. It's not geographically divided. So there's the west side, which used to be called Irian Jaya. Now it's called West Papua. And the right side, or the east, or the uh, eastern side, is um, Papua New Guinea. Um, and um, it's, you know, there's a huge spine of mountains that just extend from the western portion of the bird head which is on the west side uh to the eastern portion of uh, Moro uh port moresby and everything on the papua new guinea side and the bolins typically have inhabit anything around 6500 uh to 8500 feet uh they're right around that range so it's prime habitat in that area that um that they're focused in predominantly i, I haven't found anything lower than that i would i, I don't want to say that they're only found in that uh because i can't you know validate it but I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, the Papua New Guinea side is uh, if there'd be lower elevation areas where they're at, they're at. but it, it's incredibly dangerous uh, to go to Papua New Guinea to do research as an outsider. Uh, I mean, it's dangerous in West Papua, but it's really dangerous in Papua New Guinea. So I haven't made it over there yet, uh, but I will probably in the next couple of years. Okay. So um, in New Guinea, as far as um, that would be like the mountain range that, say, separates like green tree python species, right? So green trees can't live at that elevation, but well, the bolins are almost solely there? Um, I don't know. I don't want to say they can't live there. Bolins are, are up there. They like it cool, um, and they're very niche-oriented to their environment. They're very specific. 
uh, to what they require from what I've observed. Uh, the green tree pythons are found all throughout New Guinea uh, and uh, locality types are represented by so many different areas. So uh, I would hate to say that they're not found at that elevation. I've never personally seen one that high up. Um, I've seen them down in lower elevation, but not that high. So, so I don't, I don't know really. I don't want to say yes, they're only found there, but, but anything up at that high elevation, it's, it's, it's going to be typically just Boland's pythons. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of me getting into the fact that, you know, if you've ever been to high elevation, as far as, um, you know, I lived in Colorado when you're down at sea level, you know, maybe a 40 degree difference. What's the temperature difference and humidity difference and stuff at elevation there in New Guinea? So when you start getting up high in the, in, uh, in the highlands, I mean, on Papua, like um, uh, in certain of the certain town areas that are up, up north, uh, you know, it's the 70s and 80s in the daytime. It's very jungly feeling. But as soon as you start getting into the highlands, uh, the temperatures are, you know, 60s to 70s in the daytime. I took a temperature of 49 degrees one morning uh, up in habitat. Um, but obviously the snakes aren't out exposed to that. They're tucked away in their nest sites. Um, and I... I I, uh, I use the word nest sites because they do utilize nests, um, which is interesting for uh, pythons in general, in my opinion. Um, so uh, the temperatures are really, really cool and it's always damp. So it's prone, you know, for uh, prime respiratory problems. So they've got it pretty figured out. So are you seeing, um, you know, like a lot of our Indonesian, Indo-Australian pythons, are you seeing them all throughout their life cycle and are they when they're younger more ar arboreal and then they get too heavy bodied and then are more terrestrial do you see anything like that um well yes and no so i've never seen i've seen babies hatching but i've been there for a hatching time but i've never s encountered a baby out in the wild i've never encountered a young animal uh i i had an animal that was collected that was brought to me that i saw that was young probably uh maybe three or four and um but i've never found anything younger than that so my main focus of when I'm out there is I'm visiting the nesting areas to see how many females are nesting this year or, or last year um, and trying to observe the population that I remember from before with all my you know, data that I'm collecting. I'm also seeing if there's any habitat loss or you know, uh, more settlements being built up there that are going to be affecting it in long term. So I can try to help out if I need to or kind of bring some um, – attention to them um but i mean it's incredibly difficult navigating in that kind of a habitat um there's a it's it's very primitive forest uh very overgrown lots and lots of uh moss and roots and ferns and stuff so a small 12 inch little baby would disappear in a you know at a blink of an eye um so it's it's very difficult to encounter so once they hatch after they shed they're gone um and and where they go Nobody knows. I speculate that they stay underneath that uh, vegetation where they probably have access to small little uh, ground skinks and little uh, little rodents if they come across it and stuff like that too. But even that, I don't, I can't guarantee that or, or you know, say it's right. Okay. So do you think that? I mean, obviously the temperatures are pretty low up there, so maybe they're, you know retreating underground or under a layer of dead leaves or plants like you said and maybe it's a little bit warmer of a microclimate for them and they don't retreat out of there yeah that would make more sense to me uh with with the how fragile the babies are uh i mean obviously there's there's that's where they come from that's where they live so they know what they're doing but uh, i definitely uh, agree and i think they do go under there and kind of maybe go down a little bit lower in elevation closer to the streams where there might be more abundance of smaller prey items to feed and it'll be a little warmer, uh, a little bit safer, too, because, I mean, there's not a lot of predators out there that would eat them. Uh, there's uh, birds of prey that are there, and uh, some of the ground mammals certainly would eat a baby if they got a chance to it. So uh, it'll, it'll, they help out a lot with chem uh, a more secure place for them to live, like under that vegetation. Okay. And do you think that they are rare as far as being seen or do you think that they are actually scar or scarce and endangered in the wild i don't know i've been asked that question a few times um they are they're not i don't know how to answer that um it's very difficult to get there to see them because the environment is is very uh, unforgiving so with that being said it's difficult to get an idea of how many are actually there 
So I would say, I would say they're not rare. They're just difficult to find. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the area I could be at could be the only spot, you know, who knows, but I would find it very hard to believe that there's not other populations, um, that aren't protected by the mountains and all that stuff there too, but, but they're very specific of what they like. So that could be a factor that, uh, really affects them, uh, negatively because, you know, if they're, if, you know, habitats being destroyed and it happens to be, you know, a favorable area and it's providing everything they need, you know, that might be a population right there that just doesn't exist anymore. Right. Yeah. I think that's important as far as conservation goes. I mean, we see it here in the States as far as deforestation and, and yeah. stuff. It's not always the amount of snakes. It's the amount of habitat they can, you know, go into yeah. and they have to flourish. And I, yeah, mean, I mean, if they're, you're there's they're pulling they're, out of their yearly a new species they're describing. Um, so there's plenty of places for them to, to live. But if it's suitable hab habitat that they're favoring, favoring rather, um, uh, that might be another thing. And and I believe uh, a lot of my new speculations um, are that they do utilize a home range. They have specific nesting areas and the females, in my opinion, um, come back to the same nesting areas or stay in those areas to reproduce year after year. Um, and some people are like, Oh, how do you prove that? And I'm like, well, I found, uh, I found old eggs from the year prior in the nest with a female. Um, so they're, there are areas they want, they like for a certain reason. So there's no reason for them to really cruise around um, from what I've seen. So now, do you see any males cruising for females during this time? I've never found a male. Um, that's the other thing too. Um, being that it's uh, difficult to uh, access some of the area just because of uh, navigation through there, that could be a factor. And I, and I'm so preoccupied going to these critical nesting areas that I've never found a male cruising over there. I have photos from a lot of my uh, collectors or not collectors, but hunter friends that are out there and they've sent me photos of multiple animals they've seen. So um, I'm sure what my idea, a theory, I guess, is there's a home range of, you know, three to four females uh, that produce every year, every other year. And there's one or two males that just cruise around that certain area and breed with those females, but I can't prove it yet. Uh, but, but just from what I've seen and how the habitat is and the behavior of the females, uh, that's kind of what I'm leading with. Now, are these nest sites in any particular facing any particular way, or do they have something in common? Is there something that you see, um, that they prefer as far as nest sites go? So the nesting sites that, uh, that I see is, so, uh, in the wild, they feed heavily off, um, uh, a mammal called a couscous and it's uh, equivalent to a North American opossum i guess it's the easiest way to understand it so they feed off these uh small to medium large mammals and they take over a lot of their burrows so they're these um they're almost it it looks almost like a teepee essentially that's how i look at it and it's on the side of the mountain uh in the valley uh nestled in a lot of vegetation and there's an area usually where the sun comes right down and allows for a perfect basking spot the rainwater rains off of the uh, outside of the nest, so it never is sopping wet inside. It's always dry but humid outside, so it creates this perfect little um, area for them to uh, reside in. Um, and uh, they just take those burrows over, and it, it's probably one of the reasons why they never they never leave because it's just such a perfect area. So the males are just looking for those pheromones to keep coming back. And do you see females, you know, go away from their nests at all, or even bask and bring warmth back to their nest? Yeah, I've seen uh, on uh, two or three times, I came up on a huge female, I say huge, she's like nine feet, which is a big snake, uh, sitting out basking outside of her nest. Uh, and then on that same trip, it was it was pretty awesome. We, uh, we hiked up to this spot and we found uh, a female around this bend uh, right outside of her nest basking. And um, I was doing measurements and, and taking photos and trying to record this animal. And then, then my hunter was like, yelling at me that he saw another one and there was literally another female about 20 to 30 feet below me on another spot that she was out basking to. Um, so there was another nest there that we didn't even see. Wow. So, I mean, that's pretty dense for, uh, uh how long do you hike without seeing any animals? Well, it usually takes about, uh, about a good two hours, two or three hours to get, cause it's like going up and down and up and down into different micro habitats. And then you eventually get into the area where, uh, the vegetation is very thick and you start seeing sign like 
you start seeing scat sheds. Uh, I found bones last time. We found a skeleton last time, which was pretty awesome. Uh, about 30 feet from a nesting area. Um, and, uh, that's when you can start telling that there's bullens around. You can start looking for the sign, uh, and you'll find them. Now I, um, doing research, I have this old like Mark O'Shea book that I like to read that has a lot of outdated information. But one of the things was like PNG university were successful with their bullens pythons until the female ate the male. So are you seeing in captivity or in the wild, um, females preying on males or them just eating other snakes in general? That's funny that you brought that up. You're the only other person besides Mark that's ever mentioned that to me. Because I, I, I so to you've him. talked to Mark O'Shea. Yeah, I, I've spoken to him several times about my New Guinea stuff, and uh, I sent him a bunch of information. I'm hoping he uses in his new uh, New Guinea book. Um, but yeah, he was. Uh, he told me about that story about one that was uh, eating a female, and uh, it was very unique. Of a, a very unique situation. I've heard with captive animals. Captive animals develop a really heavy feeding. An, an aggressive feeding response and that's a learned behavior from us and i've i know several instances where animals have grabbed another cage mate uh thinking it's a prey item hold on my dogs are in the way <laughs> um or um or a si similar situation but not actively like going after a snake another bullens to eat so um but yeah i i grew up watching mark o'shea stuff i i you know people hated me because i never really cared for steve Irwin. Um, but I absolutely loved Mark O'Shea's TV series. It was fantastic because it, it reminded me of being like the adventurer, you know, you never always find it, but, um, it's always exciting. There's always an adventure to look for it. I think, um, part of what they were saying is their success was basically, they kept it in, a shack that didn't have good, um, you know, a good roof or anything above it. So it rained inside the enclosure and stuff like that. So they said that, you know, high humidity was a large um, reason that they were successful in captivity. What do you think? Well, I mean, uh, Papua New Guinea is different than West Papua too. It's, it's hotter in certain areas. It's a different environment. I mean, it's very similar, but temperatures are different. There's speculation that the animals on the PNG side are different than the western uh west popwood side or the Aryan animals but it hasn't been really confirmed really it's just a theory a lot of people have including myself um uh, high humidity is uh, the environment therein is is very humid uh constant humidity with no way to escape that is one one way to quickly get your animals to have scale issues and respiratory problems and other health related issues so by saying high humidity you know it has to become a combination of clean oxygen or clean exchange of air, you know, circulating fans, things like that, not just by having a little hot box of, you know, of humid air, but they certainly require that. Uh, I have humidifier, I have humidifier in my snake room with my bolens, uh, and it helps out a lot. Um, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend cranking them up like ridiculous amounts of humidity, but, but they do require, uh, to have that and it's very beneficial to have. So, Okay. And you, you kind of hinted at the whole um, taxonomy thing. So I believe way, way, way back in the day, these were liasses and then there were Moralia and now they're lumped in with scrub pythons. They might as well be lumped in with Leo Python and anything else. Um, what's so much heavier bodied than a lot of the scrubs you see? Um, their heads kind of Moralia like, um, what's your idea on taxonomy? Um, so like taxonomy, that's a, I can't even follow it half the time. I mean, they're going to always be Morelia to me. Um, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, no, it's ridiculous. But um, uh, from what I understood from the, the paper that came out, I think it was 2014, uh, where they reclassified them and grouped them in with all the scrubs. Uh, and went to Somalia based off of uh, head shape and dentition. So they were more or less uh, similar to a lot of the scrubs based off of that. You know, and people are going to, crucify me for saying it but i think they're completely different than scrub pythons they behave differently they're smarter in my opinion and that's no disrespect to the scrub python guys but it's just a different animal um, i mean scrubs are probably this one of the smartest pythons we have in captivity though so i agree that's a lot very intelligent for what they are but uh there's something about a bull's python that's very unique and it's uh it's a very ancient kind of uh quality 
Uh, and it, it's hard to understand it if you've never worked with one, but once, but the people that have, or, or, you know, did, they can automatically say, Oh yeah, I know exactly what you mean. There's something different about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, taxonomy wise, I mean, obviously, you know, they lumped it in there with all the others because of based off of morphological similarities and whatnot. So that's obviously going to be the, the, the easiest thing for it. So. And in captivity, we see a lot of, I mean, I've seen very, very large bolins. I mean, you explained in the wild, maybe 10 feet. I've probably seen close to that or excess of that in a very heavy bodied snake. Um, what's the body structure like in the wild? And is it consistent with what we're keeping in captivity? So it's very different from captivity in the wild. Um, animals that are like nine to 10 feet in the wild are like really, really old animals. Um, and um, the, the, the one thing with bolins, pythons in captivity is they love to eat. You know, it's like a fat kid at a buffet. They will not stop. They will, you will present them every day and they will eat. Um, and a lot of people see that as an opportunity to raise their animal up faster to uh, potentially try to have success by breeding. And that is a very, very poor idea, in my opinion. Uh, it cuts back on the animal's health, too. Obviously, we want to provide everything we want with our animals and we want to make sure they're feeding properly. But, uh, based off of behavior like that, they develop a very aggressive feeding response. And in the long run, I feel like it'll affect uh, the animal's health as well as any success you will have in uh, potentially reproducing them. In the wild, they're very muscular. They're lean, but they're a solid snake. They're, they're not a, uh, a fat animal by any means, but they're substantial size, if that makes sense. Um, in captivity, I've seen animals that have just been morbidly obese, just like gigantic. Um, and I mean, it, I love seeing Boland's pythons. I love seeing a skinny Boland's python. I love seeing a fat Boland's python because it's a Boland's python. But it's frustrating when I see animals that are very, very obviously overfed because it's not the best way uh, to maintain them. Um, and unfortunately, people see them as, oh, they're hungry still, so I'm going to keep feeding them. Or I'm going to give them a bigger food item. That'll fill them up. And then they want more. So... I feed my animals uh, every eight to 14 days, um, one, you know, appropriately sized rodent. Um, and uh, during cycling, it's even less uh, sometimes to kind of switch that that mode. And is it is it your idea to get an animal from a baby? How, did you purchase your animals as babies or adults? Yeah, babies are the best way to go. Um, because for a number of factors, obviously, the babies uh, just acclimate so well to captivity. Uh, I mean, there's still some special requirements that you need to do, take in consideration when you're working with them. However, they respond so much better than uh, adult animals like in the 70s and 80s were coming in as fresh imports. And they just were building this terrifying reputation of, you know, dying overnight, which still can happen. Um, I know a lot of keepers that have been working with these animals and are very proficient and very knowledgeable. And all of a sudden I'll have an animal die for no reason. I mean, it happens, but uh, the babies are great because you can maintain them on a certain uh, routine and boneless pythons are very routine oriented. So switching that routine uh, can be detrimental in some cases. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Keith McPete, he has a saying uh, it's, you've got to create the rhythm of the room. And that's very, very um, important with keeping bolts pythons. Routine is, is, a, is an important thing. Now, are you considering their habitat as far as making it a bit cooler in the enclosure? Um, what kind of hotspot are you working with? So, like, I've had some people say, oh, you know, you've got to breed them because you've got to be able to replicate New Guinea. And I'm like, well, show me somebody re replicating New Guinea. It's, it's impossible. In my opinion, it, good, good luck. Uh, it's just such a bizarre and unique place that's so intricately designed to maintain these animals and these animals to live there that it would be incredible if you could do it but i don't think you can so what we've been focusing with and when i say we um the, the bolts python community because it's not just me um I, there's a lot of incredible people that are actively working with these animals alongside me uh that um that are trying to you know better off these snakes as well as try to reproduce them in captivity uh, not for a financial gain, but for a conservation aspect of it and to help promote what we're trying to do. And with that being said, like the observations that I make when I'm out there, we try to relate that to the easiest parameters we can replicate in captivity, which typically comes down to temperature. 
Uh, and uh, it seems to be that um, uh, obviously they, they like it really cool. So we try to provide them during certain seasons, uh, you know, cool temperatures and even, you know, near freezing some cases um, on, uh, on during cycling and things like that. Like I, I posted a photo the other day of uh, this female I'm working with right now that's on loan for me from a good friend. And uh, she was uh, sitting in her box and the temperature was uh, 48 degrees. And, uh, and, but her routine, her rhythm of the room is she comes out every morning and baths for three hours and then disappears. So with the basking, we try to provide a um, substantial amount of heat for them, but it's not over overloading because the way they're designed in their habitat is it's very cool in general. So they have to absorb the quickest amount of heat in the shortest amount of time. So if you put a basking light on a Bones Python, it'll bask all day in captivity. But in the wild, there's factors that we don't take in consideration, like cloud cover comes by, blocks out the sun. You know, the rain will come through, makes everything wet. Snakes will disappear and they go back in their nest spot, their nest sites. Or in captivity, we just give them a basket spot and we think they need that. But they don't. They'll, they'll overdo themselves, uh, not harming themselves, but potentially harming themselves in reproductive aspects. So I'm trying to draw a, um, a similarity, like as far as, um, obviously, evolutionary, they have grown to the fact of where heat may be uh, very, very scarce in their area. So when it comes, they try to absorb as much as possible. So right. like kind of like if you're a human, you want to eat all the time because all of a sudden foods all, you know, available when back in the day exactly. we would feast. And the other thing, too, with them is uh, uh, that brings up a really interesting topic that a lot of people are still trying to uh to digest is how important ultraviolet exposure like ultraviolet lighting exposure is for snakes and especially Boland's pythons and the reason being is they're very high elevation well they're closer to the sun so they ex get that exposure of really high amounts of ultraviolet light um, so imagine a 65 or 70 degree day with cloud cover but you feel like basically an oven's on the back of your neck or something because the uv exposure is so intense that it is just cooking down on you. And they utilize that to help warm their bodies very, very quickly. Um, and then they're gone. Um, but we're finding out a lot of interesting things by incorporating the ultraviolet light with specifically Bolens that might change a lot of attention on other captive arboreal snakes or other snakes in general. Because for years, I mean, we expect, you know, we utilize the theory of they get everything they need from the diet they get. You know, with snake wise, I mean, lizards and turtles and tortoises and, and, and whatnot need to have that ultraviolet light, but snakes don't need it because they get everything from the food they're eating. So, with that being said, um, in captivity, they really respond well to having that ultraviolet light source in there. And there was a study I did for, I think, three or four years while I was working at, while I was at the zoo working with the Bolins there. And I split up ultraviolet light and basking access uh with fluorescent tubes and a basking heating element and through certain portions of the year i would see the females gravitating towards the ultraviolet lighting area where the high output was going and would lessen their interest to the basking area so at first i thought it was just kind of a, a fluke or a coincidence but then i started seeing you know in the stack of enclosures i could see a female and a female and a female in the exact same place basking under that ultraviolet light so I started incorporating ultrasound technology and on the onset of the heavy uh, basking of fluorescent lighting and the UV exposure, females had begun to start developing follicles. So with, the co with uh, putting that together, uh, it was very obvious that in the wild that that ultraviolet exposure is very important because they're seeking it out in captivity. When we're not providing that as well. Um, so they're very, very... Um, I mean, they're incredible snake. Uh, it's the easiest way to, to describe it. Uh, they're very specialized, very unique. Uh, they're not like anything I've ever worked with. And um, a, a lot of the other keepers really agree on that statement because they're just, they're not problematic. They're just very specialized. That's probably the best way to say it. Now, is there a rainy season and a, or a rainy season and a dry season as far as maybe a season that has a lot of the cloud cover and that has less and that's when they breed? Yeah, well, biggest thing in <clears throat> new guinea is it's always raining it's just it might be raining a little heavier or a little longer um typically in the wild may june july are uh breeding season but we don't see 
uh, copulate, or I take that back. We do see copulation. You put a bolus python together with a bolus python and they're adults, they're going to breed. Uh, they just like to breed. So, but in captivity, the successes we've seen have not been based around wild uh, reproductive seasons. They've not been bred May, June, July. It's typically, uh, you know, cooling is starting in uh, October, November, December, pairing up in January, February, stuff like that. So it's, it's flipping, you know, the season. Um, but that might not be the case. It just happened to work that way. So, so we have seen um, other species, whether it be skinks or, you know, any Indo-Australian species, as far as flipping them from, you know, going past the equator and you're making their summer winter, but you don't think that that they necessarily just go with the room change. They don't necessarily need to stay in the same rhythm their whole life. Yeah, it's, I'd like to say yes. I'd like to say no. <laughs> um, I don't really know. Um, what's worked well for some of the keepers is not what works in the wild, if that makes sense. And, and I don't know if that's just because what we're putting, uh, what what we're exposing them to, or if it's so ingrained in them that that that's how it is. Um, but to say that we understand the reproductive behavior and all that, I mean, that's just, that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, we're yeah. still still like, I mean, we're the, to say you understand Bones Python, it's crazy. We're learning things new every day about these animals. And every time I think personally, I figured something out, I go back out there and I'm just like, oh, shit, here we go again. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, crumble up that piece of paper with a note on it that I took. You know, it's, it's completely different. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's exciting because it's still a species that we know very little about. And that, I think, is an allure to a lot of people. Now, what part of the process are we seeing, you know, captivity fail them as far as I've seen a bunch of people get locks, but maybe it's within, uh, you know, egg, you know, building follicles and stuff like that. Where are people getting snagged up? So uh, the way where they're getting snagged is they're not getting any eggs. That That's typically what happens. Uh, like I said before, bulls will breed. That's not a problem. They will breed, breed and breed, and, you know, until they're you know, big slugs laying there. There's nothing left. But so what we're starting to understand now, or we think we're understanding is that the introduction phase of the animals is being exhausted out too early or too soon. So it's causing the males to be just too exhausted for when their females are actually receptive and building mature follicles that need to be fertilized. So, and then the combination of allowing animals uh, inadequate temperatures and exposure uh, with that is just proving, you know, no success. Uh, I think what we've seen over the years of, of, of where we thought reproduction was taking place is actually the female building follicles and that is being mistaken for uh, ovulation and stuff. So... Okay, so who has, um, I know we've had success in Europe, and I had heard like the Barkers have bred them way back in the day. Um, who has had success stateside with Bolin's pythons? So uh, the Barkers, uh, that's one species the Barkers have not bred. Uh, they, they were the, the first ones to hatch eggs, which is quite an achievement. So they were the first successful hatching of the eggs. Uh, so they got a, a female in that was gravid already? Uh, and uh, then the eggs were laid and uh, she developed or and then they were fortunate enough to hatch them. Uh, then there was another instance uh, with uh, a female and a male at one of the facilities they were at uh, that was courting. And the female, uh, she was depositing eggs and the male um, spurred the eggs and the eggs damaged and were inviable. I mean, there's a big story with it. Um, but they were the first to uh, to hatch uh, a clutch of bullets. Uh, Paul Miles was the first to actually successfully reproduce. Uh, then there was a couple other people that got lucky on one instance. There was a gentleman in Florida that produced them a couple times, but his animals eventually died. Um, but nobody knows why. Um, then there was a couple uh, instances where some slugs had been presented. And then about... 400 ghost stories of oh i bred those and i got so tired of seeing babies that i stopped breeding bolins pythons you know those stories so. <laughs> uh but right now uh the person really that is um just doing an absolutely breathtaking job is frederick over in sweden uh this will this is his 
fifth, fourth or fifth time successfully reproducing with the same animals. Uh, and he's just incorporated uh, several new animals into his group that he's going to be attempting to work with as well this season. Uh, so it should be very exciting uh, to see. But he uh, he's, I mean, it's incredible with what he's doing. And it's very simplistic approach to everything. There's no secrets of any sort. It's just, you know, timing and being observant to the animals for what they're requiring. So there's... Um... There's a bunch of different things that could be happening as far as I feel like when people try to breed, a lot of times it's one, one and one as far as, you know, they have one male, one female. Is it possible that they can maybe, you know, need to be compatible pairs? Is it possible that, you know, something with olive pythons where you need two males to combat or something like that? Um, are there people working with the larger groups of them? So there's been attempts of multiple males with, uh, you know, single female and scenarios like that. Um, they breed and breed and breed, but I, you know, I think all those scenarios can potentially work. However, the steps involved afterwards or the prior observations of when it's actually, you know, time, uh, are just not being addressed, uh, correctly. And that's, what's causing it not to happen. So. Okay. And then, um, as far as animals in the wild um are people still you know with the groups that you go out of are they collecting eggs and bring them back and then being hatched out and then sold to us and imported here so a lot of animals um are being farm bred where they have animals and there are some successes um in uh in a lot of the farms um with them not as much as, as they used to that's one of the reasons why it's becoming so scarce uh to to find find animals and one of the reasons why um, myself and uh, a lot of really dedicated uh, keepers are really trying to figure out what we need to do to, f to be able to sustain a po captive populations. Um, so that's one of the reasons, you know, that we're really working hard on trying to find out what Frederick's doing so well and um, trying to implement that into captive U.S. collections uh, because there's certainly enough babies in our captivity. We should be able to start producing animals uh, ourselves here to be able to minimize any kind of, um, you know, over collecting or any pressures from the wild, stuff like that. Okay. And we know that, especially with green tree pythons, people here who are into green tree pythons, we know that usually farm bred is a very loose term for probably wild caught. So, um, yeah. How do you digest yeah. that? <laughs> Pretty much that way. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, okay. it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's such a gray area with a lot of it. Um, the fortunate thing though, is we have access to babies, uh, and those babies we can raise up for the most part correctly, where they become accustomed to the routine that we're trying to establish. And those are going to be our founding breeders and, uh, hopefully the su success for the future, uh, of, of, of bones pythons in captivity, in my opinion. Um, so that'll take away any of that wild pressure from collecting in you know, the quote unquote farm bred or farm hatched or whatever animals, um, because uh, we really need to start figuring it out before it's too late with the animals out there or just habitat where it just becomes too difficult to access. Now, I think there's a big disconnect in between the zoological world and, um, you know, the hobbyist side as far as people in the zoological world may not see that there's any room for anyone doing, you know, what we do as hobbyists or you know, someone like the Barkers, um, if you guys want to read a book, Invisible Ark, they kind of outline the fact that us as hobbyists have a responsibility to also do conservation and reproduce things like Boland's pythons so we don't collect them from the wild forever. So do you feel like the zoological community is, because you kind of have a foot in both, um, is the zoological community supposed to be responsible for conservation or, you know, do you have faith in captive keepers and things like this? That's a really good question. So um, I went into the zoo field as a private hobbyist. Um, and I still am a private hobbyist, but I'm also in the zoo field. It's weird. Try not uh, to get fired here. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, um, I, I totally agree with uh, the Barker statement. It, we do have an obligation as keepers to maintain what we are passionate about. And by saying that, we need to maintain by reproducing our animals, by studying what we can, conservation, 
um, you know, outreach, anything that would be incorporated that we'd be doing in the zoo world, there should be no difference. The only difference that I've seen in the zoo world from the private sector is permits to have certain animals that we can't have as privates. Um, and there's more red tape involved in being in a facility that's in the zoo, zoo world. Uh, those, that's just what I've seen. Um, I love being in the zoo world, though, because it gives a different insight to what I love doing. So I try to incorporate what I learned in the zoo field with my private work and the conservation. Un unfortunately, it's difficult a lot of the times for private individuals in the private sector to be able to do legitimate conservation work because we are looked down at by zoo facilities and other larger corporations and organizations that are that are on that side of the, the fence as just a bunch of hobbyists. I, but in turn, I have seen some of the most incredible collections and some of the most incredible data and met some of the most amazing people that are in those private collections. And I've met some real assholes in the zoo field that could care less. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't let that discourage anybody from wanting to do conservation work being a private hobbyist by any means. Uh, because that's what we love to do. And if we don't love to do it, then we're not going to have these animals around anymore. So we have to start somewhere. And how do you feel about, I mean, there's a lot of species, especially here in the U.S., that, you know, people want a captive breed or we want to captive breed and send to our friends in a state or whatever. And, you know, they ban us from having those certain animals because they don't want us wild collecting. But at the same time, we have a plethora of captive born, you know, black pine snakes, but black pine snakes can't be shipped interstate. How does that really help us? I don't know. I mean, it, um, that's a tough, it's a tough question. It's a real tough area to really, you know, to dive into, um, because by collecting animals, we ensure for the most part that we're going to have more animals. If we don't, we leave these animals to face whatever, you know, difficulties they're going to have there, which is mostly habitat loss, you know, and, and, and perishing because of us. So it, it's a tough, it's a tough area to really discuss. Um, I don't know if I'm qualified enough to really, to really delve in, you know, dive into it really, but, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough area. It's, it's a big question. And I, I hear a lot of that. Like, why are you, you know, why do you think it's acceptable to take animals in captivity? Don't we have this? And we, and it's like, well, yeah, we need this. Otherwise it's going to be gone, you know? And, and that's one of the things why I'm trying to do with the Bolins is we have these animals, we have these keepers, you know, I'm trying to develop programs that I've learned and I've seen developed in the zoo field, but I'm trying to bring it to the private sector where I'm trying to get those people that are, hidden you know underground with these collections to get involved so we can establish something solid in captivity to alleviate any wild collecting pressure we'll have established groups of animals that will be for facilities as well as privates and that way we can assure that we'll have these animals around when it becomes more and more difficult when we're just doing habitat loss and, and more problems now, Bolins are under CITES. Are they protected, or what kind of barriers are there into importing them here in the U.S.? Uh, so, they, so they are. Uh, you have to go through paperwork to to import them in. Not everybody can import them in. Um, as far as facility, not all facilities out there or farms are allowed to export. Um, it's illegal to or regulated. You cannot export adults anymore. It used to be adults back in the day. That's why they got such a horrible reputation of just being, you know, you can't do anything with them because they would die because the animals would just be so stressful or stressed out and they would just end up eventually die. Um, anything over in east, the eastern portion of the island on Papua New Guinea is uh, illegal to export. You can't export out of Papua New Guinea. Uh, so those animals are at least safe. However, the biggest uh, threat I've been running into uh, with going over to West Papua and speaking with friends in Papua New Guinea is all the, the new mining for all these uh, gold and silver and coal and all these things. And they're just tearing up the, you know, the mountains, which are habitat for these animals and other animals too, that 
they feed off of and just live there. So it's only a matter of time before, you know, greed takes over as with everything. And uh, these prime habitats for these snakes are pretty much gone uh, based off of that. Um, you know, habitat in itself where, you know, people living there, that's going to be minimal, I think, to an extent. But the biggest issue is going to be these mining uh, operations because they just poison everything, take up all the usable resources that these animals be needing, uh, and just devastate everything out there. Okay, so what are you doing as far as um, do you have adult animals that you're trying to go this year? Yeah, I've got uh, I have three young animals that are about five and a half years old now uh, that I raised up from babies, uh, and they're males that are ready that should be ready to go this year. Uh, and then I have one other uh, young yearling animal, a female that I'm still raising. There's nowhere, you know, she's got, you know, five to six years before she go. And then I have uh, uh, a large 10 year old and a female that's on loan from a friend of mine, David, that's in California. And she's going to be paired up with these males I have. Uh, so that, so as of uh, October, uh, everybody's been cycling. Uh, and with hopes of pairing up next month and uh, going through the routine. I did it a couple times before, and I got really, really close, but um, a lot of my inconsistencies were from the lack of ID on the temperatures and excessive basking and everything. Um, so uh, I think I have a very good shot this year, but I've said that before, <laughs> and everybody says that. So um, it, it'll just be going through the motion. Um, and uh, paying attention to the female's behavior and uh, observing everything. And uh, I've got a lot of incredible people on uh, this group I developed, uh, and we're all kind of going through the same routine at the same time and just checking in with each other daily on what animals are doing, what observations are, suggestions. And hopefully this should be – I mean, if it works, this could be an incredible year for captive animals. All right, cool. So this is the part where since Melissa is not here – I got to pee, but I got to leave you on a decent question that you can talk about long enough ah, while I pee. How do I pee? So, <laughs> so, yeah. so um, as far as Frederick goes, he's obviously been successful in captivity. Um, have you been able to talk to him and what things have you taken away from his success that you're going to add to what you're trying with your Bullens right now? Okay, cool. So um, when I first met Frederick, I flew out actually uh, to Sweden uh, for to give a couple lectures uh, regarding uh, Bolins in captivity and in the wild. And uh, I went to his facility because I had to see what he was doing and see if there was any correlation from what I was doing or what other privates were up to. So um, that's when I first met him. And then we just kind of uh, meshed and threw ideas at each other uh, back and forth um, and tried to incorporate what he found to be successful uh, and with what we were doing. And there weren't a lot of inconsistencies with what he was doing and what captivity was the thing though with frederick is he's very observant um with uh his his animals that was like the quickest p ever <laughs> um and um uh, he's very in tune with what he's doing and i think that is a huge successful factor with him uh that helps him with with what he's uh achieving um I've always said it before that we're so sloppy when it comes to reptile stuff compared to the Europeans, in my opinion. I mean, they're always like ahead of the game. I've always been like, oh, my gosh, what are they doing now? You know, it's, it's incredible. And he's a prime example of just an incredible keeper, uh, an incredible person, a, uh, just an awesome friend. Um, and he's just very adamant about in the involvement he has with my work um, privately and in the wild. Um, it just I couldn't be. Uh, happier to have somebody um, in the group that, that contributes so much uh, to new people also, not just people that are, uh, you know, advanced working with things. Very cool. I, I always know that um, in Europe and stuff, just everything's so much more strict on laws and stuff like that. I wasn't even sure if um, people were able to keep something like a Boland's Python. What kind of um, you may have touched on this while I was gone, but what kind of enclosure is he keeping them in and what kind of differs from your setup? Um, yeah. So like the regulations are very different uh, over there too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're allowed to keep certain things. Uh, it's just 
there's more red tape involved with being involved to do it correctly. Uh, but his setups are very similar to a lot of captive setups. Uh, they're a vision style enclosure, uh, but a European model. Um, and uh, he's got, you know, ultraviolet light that we've discussed with him, uh, or I discussed with him, and he's incorporated that in there. Um, is, uh, you know, basking elements, uh, you know, everything in there that would be. Uh, would be needed for everything but so it's it's not very it's not very different from what we have uh the the thing that's really helping him out is just his observation skills with his animals and how tuned he is with his specific animals that he has uh that he's seeing these uh, little bits and pieces of information that he's able to utilize gotcha and um as far as heat sources he using like radiant heat panels something that um you know we would use over here or what is he using um, no uh, Use the, we we all pretty much use uh, the over uh, over tank heating elements. Uh, so there's actually daylight uh, day heat or daylight. That's ridiculous. What to say? A uh, visual heat or visual light rather um, incorporated instead of just like radiant heat panels. Uh, I think it's important. You know, it's like it's bright out, so it's gonna be warm. So that's what I'm gonna come out as opposed to being dark and there's warmth. I, I think that psychologically affects some animals uh, more than others. Um, and these are, you know, different animal, different, different types of snakes, different, you know, so I, I think it really helps out with that. So are they essentially getting a nighttime drop all the time? Yeah. Uh, they get exposed to a nighttime temperature drop. Um, it's not as, um, uh, radical as it is during this, uh, cycling time, but it is substantial, you know, so like in the sixties, you know, it's not uncommon and, uh, they're, they're very capable of handling that. It's, they're pretty incredible with what they can do. Uh, I think I took temperatures of animals that were like in, you know, nighttime temperatures in the fifties and, you know, they're sitting at 60 degrees body temp. So they're able to maintain that temperature, uh, very, very well. But, um, the, uh, during cycling time, you know, obviously the temperature is going to be in the fifties, low fifties. Uh, but, uh, during the normal times of the year, it's gonna be like, uh, mid to low sixties. So I had read of observations of Boland's pythons having a meal and actually, going to the cool side of the enclosure. Have you in experienced anything like that? I have not seen it firsthand, but I have heard of a situation like that. Um, and there could be a number of factors, uh, in my opinion, that could be that, uh, that could, could cause that. But um, I've never seen it before. Um, but it's not to say that, you know, it could just be a normal situation of some sort. Um, but yeah, um, it could be just inadequate temperature. Uh, it could be too hot. You know, it could just be, too cool. Uh, it, it's different variables in it, but uh, I've not witnessed it myself. Gotcha. So these are animals that clearly are pretty elusive as far as you're not seeing anything but the females that are nesting. Um, do you think we may in captivity have some type of disconnect as far as um, snakes in captivity usually try to pick you know, the structure over heat as far as if I put a stationary hide on the cool side of my cage, even a ball python may stay in there in instead of staying on the heat side, but they're exposed. So is there anything that you've done as far as hides and stuff like that? Um, I have my heating elements and my ultraviolet light separate from each other. I'm not utilizing like a combination uh, because I like to observe behavior associated with that. And then I have my hides, like my nest boxes for my males and my females on the opposite end where it's nice and dark and a little and cooler. So that way it's establishing that they're going to be coming out. Like I, I try to draw as much natural behavior as I observe in the wild for my captive animals. So I have a, a nest box on the far left of the enclosure that it's nice and dark and quiet. Uh, and that would simulate a nest in the wild. And then my basking light would come on in the far right of the enclosure and that would simulate, you know, when the daytime comes, the morning comes out, you know, the sun's up, blah, blah, blah. Snake comes out of its nest, goes all the way over the edge where it's going to be a nice spot to bask. And then when it's done, when the cloud cover comes over and takes away that heat, it's going to shoot back, back into its nest spot where it's going to be nice and secure and, and, you know, maintain the rest of that warmth throughout the day. Are you seeing these, are the prey items, is it just couscous or have you seen any type of... Um you know, any other prey that they've eaten out there? So uh, the locals tell me they feed a, predominantly off of couscous and there's another a small rodent called a bandicoot and it looks like a big rat. Um, I've also heard they eat birds too out there. I've never seen one eating anything. I uh, have not done any stomach analysis at all yet. 
I probably will achieve, try to do that this time. Excuse me, I got hiccup. Um, but um, I've uh, seen some birds, like kind of like dove species. There's so many different species of birds there too. It's hard to identify. But a lot of it too is, you know, um, I'm pretty pretty good at climbing now out there. But I'm still clumsy compared to some of these locals. I mean, they're like a ghost walking through there. So I'm sure I let everything in about 100 miles know when I'm walking through there. And it's just going to take off. So I miss a lot of it. But um, one of the interesting topics that we were discussing on this group was uh, uh, frequency of food and the abundance of food. Like how often uh, prey item size that they might be consuming in the wild. And um, it's an area that's really interesting because based off of, you know, captive feeding requirements, you know, or abundance of how frequently they're feeding or how often they'll take. You know, would they feed off of a big couscous and it would last them a month in the wild or would they be looking for more food if they got it? I think they're more opportunistic than anything um, because the environment is so nasty that suitable uh, areas for them to reside are difficult to acquire. So they're going to basically be establishing those home areas. And if something comes through, then they're going to snag it. Uh, I don't think they move around a lot either, but I don't know. The males might move more. Okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's my opinion on it. So what has been the most interesting experience as far as being in New Guinea? I mean, staying with these tribes, where are you staying and where are you sleeping and all that? So when I go out there, um, I typically stay in the village. Um, and I sleep in the men's hut because the men and the women have a, a different, uh, huts they sleep in. It's called a Honai. And, um, so I sleep in the men's hut, the men's hut rather with uh, all the other hunters and stuff like that. So are these like, so all the, all the men stay together and are these like huts off the ground? Kind of what you see in national geographic shit. Um, well, well, the, the Donnie, which are the predominant, uh, indigenous tribe that's in that region that i'm at uh they have their huts on the ground uh the ones that are up in the tree are called korowai uh they're in a different area but um the uh donnie's uh honai are like these uh grass huts uh that are like enclosed and they've got like a fire pit inside them they're actually really comfortable uh and it keeps it nice and warm when it's cold at night and uh I mean, it's pretty cool. You get to hear them all singing and talking and everything like that. They never shut up. They're always talking for hours and hours, even when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, people always wonder, uh, what do you eat out there? So uh, uh, the Donnie that I stay with are um, master farmers. So most of the time, what I'm eating is like cooked sweet potatoes. Um, and I'll, I'll bring like, uh, what is it, a cup of noodles with me. Um, and that's, a, that's about it. Uh, so I shit a lot when I'm out there <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, sometimes, uh, we'll get like sardines or something like that. Every once in a while we'll get like, uh, prawns. We'll catch prawns and eat those. But most of the time it's sweet potatoes, which are pretty good. I like. So you just grow root vegetables. They're not, um, you know, yeah. I'd like to think people out there, you're always eating fish and fucking oh, yeah. hog or whatever. Yeah. Meat is like a, a, a really rare, uh, situation uh most of the time it's like uh, rooted vegetables and, and things like that rice or uh taro taro is disgusting i hate taro it's like a so like do you get giardia every time or i, I try to because it's great weight loss um but, <laughs> uh, uh, i get used to it pretty I, i'm pretty used to it now so um uh it doesn't happen that often but it, you know every once in a while though so uh, I can I can hit a target probably about a hundred yards away if I really bear it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the what's the length of time that you're living with these uh, with the tribe, and what kind of technology are you taking out there in comparison to what they have? So, um, I'm usually there for about a week to two weeks with them in the site, and I've got you know my GPS stuff. I've got all my camera equipment. Uh, I've got. Portable weather stations, UV meters. Uh, I had a drone or I have a drone with me also that I started implementing with me last time uh, to do aerial uh, video. Um, I've got all sorts of like uh, audio recorders, uh, trail cams, all sorts of stuff like that. I'm trying to, my biggest thing right now that I'm trying to raise money for is uh, this new telemetry equipment I'm trying to get uh, where it'll be GPS satellite. Uh, so basically I implant uh, a, a tracker and uh, two of these animals and I can 
have them uh, GPS marked um, anywhere from the world. So I could be sitting at home taking a crap and I can check them and see where the snakes are. Uh, and with that, it'll, you know, share so much information on, you know, where the males are going, the females and this and that. So, but, uh, I try to bring a lot of things with me when I'm there that I need, um, maybe like four or five pairs of clothes and that's it. The rest is just like, you know, equipment I could use. So do you bring anything for them every time, you know, for letting you stay over? Yeah. I always bring them something like flashlights or gloves or sweaters or things like that. Um, one time, uh, I bring like candy, things like that, uh, just to try to share with them. Uh, they always get excited. Sometimes they'll ask for weird stuff, um, like a basketball jersey or some shit. Or, I don't know, but I try to bring as much as I can. So. Do they have like the uh, whoever lost the Super Bowl this, huh. this year, they get that shirt? Or? Yeah. I bring like, a, I brought some funny shirts. Like there's a, there's a, Le- a Leonard Skinner shirt out there right now on some kid, I'm sure, because I-, I left one with a little kid that was out there. So <laughs> He's just wearing a giant Confederate flag with yeah. Leonard Skinner across it. Pretty, pretty sweet. He thought it was pretty <laughs> awesome. So hopefully one of these days I'll see it. And one of my one of my hats from the zoo is in a in a gully right now, I'm sure. Or Yeah, it was a couple of years ago because I, I took a big fall. We had a big bridge fall out on us. And we were hiking out and dropped like 10 to 12 feet down in this gully. I lost my hat and all this stuff. And so, Holy shit. So you yeah. have, um, what, as far as you have a bunch of protective, you know, regular clothing, what are they wearing when you're out here hiking? Uh, well, they usually it's like barefoot, they're barefoot and shorts and a t-shirt. So, uh, I try to go as primitive as I can, but I, I, man, the, the rocks are just too sharp for me. So I can't walk barefoot in them. So I got boots on a t-shirt and shorts and my, my pack. And that's about it. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen like actual people who live without shoes, but their feet are like not even recognizable to what ours would be. Yeah, my friend always jokes with me because I'm always trying to take pictures of their feet and he keeps telling me I have a foot fetish. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not at all. It's like they just look like ostrich feet. I was like, they're just crazy looking. Yeah, like they're not the same feet. I mean, we exactly. clearly have um, gone a long way from where we're supposed to be. So what's kind of, do they have any type of, um, you know, celebrations or anything when you're over there? Anything cool that, Um, you know, you've got to experience? Yeah, I've seen, uh, they did a mock battle for me, which was really cool. Uh, It was pretty, pretty incredible. They uh, had about uh, 10 or 12 um, warriors come out and all like full uh, dress attire. They did a big mock battle scene where they were pretending to spear each other and shoot each other with arrows. Uh, that was pretty uh, incredible. Basically displaying what they'll do to you if you fuck up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I had, uh, I've had them bring out one of their mummies. They have a, like a 300 year old mummy of one of an ancestors for me to see. That, that was really cool. Uh, <laughs> one time uh, I was at a area where I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to be at. And it was because they were uh, cremating a body. So that was really interesting. Uh, but yeah, I've had weird stuff happen to me, uh, but it's all been just amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure death is much more of a thing in life as far as they're much closer to yeah. death than we are. Do they, do they know like what you mean when you're looking for Boland's Python the first time that they come there, do you just show them pictures and they know what oh, you're talking know what about? Or? Yeah. Yeah. The, the really interesting thing with the snake is it has such a meaning in the folklore, uh, with, with all of New Guinea. Um, uh, like there's. Uh, I mean, New Guinea has over, you know, there's several hundred tribes that are confirmed. I mean, there's probably a thousand tribes that are found throughout there. And uh, each one of those tribes has a specific reference to that snake, uh, whether it's utilized as um, a giver or a taker, a spirit, uh, a deity. Uh, some uh, There's a tribe over in Papua New Guinea that uses that. They present that snake during uh, a marriage to the bride and groom. I don't know why yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, one of them was uh, a story of it, uh, this rainbow serpent that extends over big barriers of land to connect other tribes to one another. Uh, there's like a creator story. So they're very, it, it's very uh, symbolic and everybody knows what that snake is. Uh, they know, they might not know where it's at, but they know what it is. So is it uh, hated or revered as something, you know? It's not hated. It's either uh, 
feared or res- I mean, it's respected, obviously, but some of the places uh, they're kind of scared of it just because it's a, a seen as a ghost. One place I stayed at, uh, they told me that um, uh, when people die, that the snake comes down from the mountain and takes a spirit with them and takes them back up into the mountain. Uh, and uh, one place told me that you can't uh, interrupt them because um, they'll wipe out uh, an area like out of vengeance uh, and do that. And uh, interesting thing about it, the area I was at, one of the people that was with me said that uh, he helped my friend that uh, had an accident or almost had an accident. We were there and we were passing through. And because he interacted with us in a different way, um, uh, he died a year later, had a heart attack. And they said it was because of the snake. So, so they still believe that it's, it's very, very, I mean, it's an incredible place. Um, It's not just the snake. It's the people are part of the snake and, uh, the snake are part of the people. Um, they're an incredible animal. Very cool. So do the, the people over there, do you have contact with them? Do they have, um, I think I heard, I actually heard your talk in Tinley. I don't know when it was, maybe a few years ago. But I mean, you have contact with a certain uh, person over there or something, right? Yeah, I've got uh, two good friends of mine uh, over there. One of them is in Jakarta. One of them is over in Papua. And he has a cell phone. Uh, that every once in a while I get signal and I can reach him and talk talk to him and everything and he always is expecting me to to show up on the on the airplane and stuff like that so so I do talk to him but I've had I've had a situation a lot of times I found out that uh, a lot of the locals will buy these old like little Nokia phones and <clears throat> they won't they won't be an active phone so they'll sit in the hut with everybody and they'll just be like make the noise pretending like somebody's calling him and then they'll have a big conversation with nobody on the phone just to kind of make him sound cool that's um, how homeboy gets laid over there yeah, yeah that's right got the nokia yeah. dude but it's a uh, and then they've got uh, uh was it somebody had a facebook account uh <laughs> but uh yeah it's it's cool man i love i love going there i'll retire there i will i will be living there in another 10 to 15 years for sure. Awesome. So, I mean, you like, as far as um, Indonesia as a whole, you know, you would live in the city and then you would be oh, able no, to come about, out I'm, here. I'm going to move to uh, to New Guinea. I'll be in New Guinea. Really? Yeah, I, I love it there. I just so, so primitive. I, I really enjoy it. Awesome. So what is different about being out there? I mean, your way out there, what, us living here, I mean, you live in DFW area, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, going from the city to the middle of nowhere, I mean, is that the allure as far as yeah, you know, your way up? Um, it, a lot of it is just um, kind of uh, really not having to not having to rely on anything but yourself. Uh, I mean, we take everything for granted in a daily routine, like, you know, vehicles, phones, all this and that, you know, electricity, you know, carpet. That's always a big one for me when I come back, the feel of carpet, because there's no carpet there. Uh, and uh, so it, it's getting away from it all and just be, being yourself and being exposed to these primitive kind of philosophies and ideals that these that these people utilize i mean nobody knows how old i mean there's people that don't even know how old they are it's like they don't they don't know yeah. you know they they don't know uh you know what's going on in the world you know it's you know what they're worried about is just like oh okay cool you know i'm gonna work in the garden or something like that it, it's just that simplistic idea <laughs> of of life uh and that's just a very um alluring thing to me and then combining it with the snake is just even better i mean it's just you know the snake is a part of the mountains it's a part of new guinea it's part of the people you know it's a creator it's uh you know the the taker of souls or or you know the the being that began everything you know it's it's just it's just freaking cool (laughs) yeah i think it's so interesting as far as you're seeing people that live outside the constructs that we've built in the united states of what's socially acceptable and you see people like just being people like what does it even mean to be a free person over there yeah. well that's the thing i mean it's it's like you know it's like when i get there it takes me a couple of days to kind of like kind of decommission myself a little bit and then it's just like i wake up and i'm like you know i just fell asleep in a hut with a bunch of you know natives that are just singing and talking and it's just like i wake up and i'm like all right you know okay i grab my bag and i just kind of walk up into the mountains and disappear you know it's and- like 
are they kind of like laid back, whatever? I mean, they're not in a rush to do anything. No, they, you know, they do their routine and, and that's about it. They sit around and talk and, and it's just a very different mentality. And, and it's very enticing to me. It's one of the reasons I go back so much just because of, I don't know, the, the history with it, the, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's just the, the raw power of, of how, you know, amazing it is. It's just one of those things. You know, you, now, either, do you... you either love it or you hate it. And that's the best way it was described to me when I went the first time. Either you love it or hate it. The second I got yeah. off the plane, I was like, I love it. You know. <laughs> so do you have any um, stories as far as transitions, maybe things that you didn't expect going over there or things that surprised you? Um, not so much. Um, I think just getting used to the routine and the routine is there is no routine if that makes sense. Like everybody kind of does what they want to do and it just takes forever to do anything. And you've got to learn to just kind of relax and go with the flow. And it's hard for us as, you know, Americans, cause we've got to go, 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 go over there. It's just like, Oh, great. Plane's not coming today. All right. Well, <laughs> guess I'll go back to sleep, you know, or all right, well, no food over here. Well, let's go find something else. You know, it's like, it's just like, all right, whatever. It's like, it doesn't have a plan. It doesn't have a, a routine to, to necessarily follow. How did you first um, get a guide that you knew was going to be knowledgeable? Uh, so I have a, fr a very close friend of mine in Jakarta and he's Indonesian and uh, he has a, a export company out there and he has a lot of collectors that he uses and he put me with somebody uh, to take me to, to go see them. And then at that point, uh, I became really good friends with him and, you know, stay with him and his wife and his kids. And, and, um, uh, and he's one of the main, uh, Bullens, uh, uh, hunters, I guess he likes to be called, but, um, out there and he's the one that takes me and I, I've got him involved with all my work. Uh, he's my, my guy to go to and I, and I trust him. I trust him in my life. I have a couple times. So. Awesome. What, what kind of other animals are you seeing when you're out there? <laughs> well, it's weird. Cause like, I'm so preoccupied with Bullens and just climbing and going there. It's like, I really miss, uh, seeing anything else. Um, but, um, so you got to take a pee. So I, now I get to take a pee. Okay. I'm going to talk randomly about shit. All right, cool. So there's certain, um, I mean, kind of wanting to talk about this as far as with your captive collection. So it's like, we all keep a bunch of species that, you know, people keep readily in the hobby. So really what I find interesting is finding some species that aren't, um, you know, readily kept in the hobby or aren't readily bred things that are often farmed as far as like, I think we should focus on keeping things like white lip pythons, even Brazilian rainbow boas, um, things in the hobby that we could definitely breed and, you know, stop the market from importing these, um, even though imports, you know, have a certain place in our market. But I mean, I'd really love to see some of these rare species bred in captivity so that we can take off, take pressure off of things going on in the wild. So I think the biggest thing that we can ensure in our future as private keepers is to make sure that we have a sustainable hobby, make sure that we are breeding pythons that are, you know, the pythons that are normally farmed and stuff like that. You know, your things that even Brazilian rainbow boas aren't hard to breed in captivity. You just need people doing it so we don't have to import. We import 55,000 ball pythons out of West Africa when people are basically breeding ball pythons and selling them for python jerky over here. So it's like we need to find a way to sustain ourselves and stop doing the bullshit and chasing after a fucking morph in West Africa. But anyway, that's a fucking different tangent. Uh, <laughs> so right, the, now. The, the chat said um, they can hear your dog's collar. Yeah, my no. dog. My, my, uh, I have a Rottweiler and a Chihuahua, <laughs> and they're just like right in my face. So. Yeah, could you just take their collar off or whatever so it stops jingling around? Oh, is it bothering them? Yeah, yeah. Apparently, that's all they can hear. <laughs> They're like, we just keep on hearing this jingle of something. Oh, I usually funny. do that. We used to have our dog. Um, we take her collar off every time because for some reason, whatever that, whatever, whatever that sound is, it pierces the microphone, unlike human voice. I don't know why. Really? 
Yeah, like that's like the the <laughs> main thing you can hear. <laughs> Much better. So sweet. Now that we got that down, you know, an hour and a half into the two hour podcast, yeah, you know, we're good to go now. But dogs once we stop talking, I get to read the read the comments. So cool. But um, Evan asked about the cassowary story. <laughs> go figure. Uh, OK, um, so Evan's a good friend of mine. He's on uh, the our Bolins group that we've been working with now and uh evan's a a huge supporter of my um my research um and i'm uh immensely thankful for his uh assistance he also has uh probably the i think the probably the largest collections of bones in captivity right now so once his animals are mature evan is definitely going to be a force oh this is this is the other evan i think you're are you thinking of evan stall is that this no, is this is my uh this is evan wexler i'm pretty sure that Oh no! This is Evan uh, Browder. Okay, well, Evan Wexler got a, a really <laughs> nice plug right there. So yeah, yeah. Evan, Evan Browder go. probably heard this story from something else. So, um, okay, yeah. So I remember one time when I was um, I can't remember when it was. Uh, I flew in and I was at one of the the little towns and uh, I was talking to one of my uh, hunter friends there and we were touching base and stuff and I I, I really had to take a leak and um I, I run around this building to to go take a piss back there and i just was kind of zoning out and i just heard like this like pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter and stop and i, I didn't really think anything of it because uh, there's like cars and little you know little cars and everything around me and hear this pitter patter pitter patter pitter patter and i just kind of happened to glance to my left and uh and i'm still like in mid p and uh somebody like the local a guy that had the little coffee shop I was at or whatever had a cassowary uh, tethered up by its ankle and the thing <laughs> ran right up and was headed right for my dick. Um, <laughs> and, and I jumped back so fast and I ran inside. I told my buddy, I was like, dude, there's a cassowary back there. Almost bit, almost bit my dick off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's the cassowary story. I have another one too, but it wasn't as, um, is exciting. I, I had gone. I was in a village, and I, I woke up early one morning. I was walking around. They had this kind of stabled-in area, and I I I saw movement through the through the brush uh, of like the veg not the vegetation. It's almost like thatch, and I kind of leaned up over there, and they had caught a cassowary and put it up in there, and it shot like right up in my face, and it was like looking right at me. And they had this crazy uh, yell that they do, and it just was like Rah! like right in my face. And, uh, terrify me but it was so cool cosworry is my favorite bird so i have a is this a, like uh first pick for pet over there or oh, what that's awesome they're they're a huge factor and i mean they eat them they use their feathers as decoration and stuff like that too but yeah cosworry are my favorite I, the, the people that know me i have a my whole uh, uh right leg is a huge cosworry i've tattooed on me so it's a it's a really cool bird so there's your <laughs> cosworry story <laughs> so do they feed on snakes or caterpillars cassowary yeah Cos well, they're predominantly no i'm just i'm just oh. fucking with you yeah, i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry it's been a long day uh snakes of course oh oh, oh yeah yes. large yes. pythons yeah not too large <laughs> <laughs> just large enough <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so, i mean those are your uh little glimpse of the bush and stuff like that i mean yeah there's you, I, I mean i've got so many stories there's a uh, uh, yeah, traveling there for over 10 years i mean there's so many things uh I'm, I'm working on this new book and uh i've got uh, a lot of these anecdotal stories and adventures and things i've dealt with that are in it so it's like trying to remember it all is, is crazy so hopefully i'll have stuff in there that everybody's going to enjoy it's going to be some really cool stuff what is your main goal as far as your research as a whole? So my main goal, so when I first started out working with bones pythons, like it was like with everybody else, like I wanted to be able to breed them. That was it. You know, it's like, I wanted to be able to breed them. Why couldn't, why couldn't I breed them? Why couldn't anybody else? Well, then I started taking these trips out there and my view on them completely changed. And the, the reproductive factor obviously is still alluring. And I, I, love and i hope i'm successful this year because it would be incredible 
to, to see it and be able to witness it, you know, in a controlled environment that I'm in, in control of. But um, seeing them in the wild is so much more to me than seeing them in captivity. And that's not some crazy activist theory or line or BS or anything like that. It's, it's the truth. Seeing them out there, it's, it's almost like a spiritual awakening in a way, seeing these rare animals there. So my, my goal for my, my work is to, to push conservation with them as far as being able to sustain wild populations. Uh, I would love to uh, be able to procure habitat to uh, maintain, uh, just let it grow the way it's supposed to, have a protected area for these animals to maintain what they're doing, uh, do a reintroduction program out there if I'm able to. We're able to take so many animals uh, raise them up at Head Start, re-release them in areas there to ensure that we have babies that will be there for the next years or whatever. Um, and also being able to supply uh, financial means for the locals there to be able to, to sustain, sustain them too. Um, so I have a lot of plans that I'd like to do, uh, but I would say probably uh, the conservation of being, being able to maintain, you know, sustainable populations out there is probably be the biggest thing to be able to procure land and, and maintain them so they have a place to, to to be safe yeah so that kind of brings up two questions for me as far as um <laughs> the, the conservation organizations and zoos and different type of biological entities that are conserving areas are very very particular on where the animals come from if it comes from a private collection might as well be fucking trash on the ground so yeah. where do you these animals for reintroduction um do you believe that, are you trying to breed them in a zoological, on the zoological side as well? And do you think that captive bred animals could ever be allowed to be reintroduced into the wild? Um, I would never put captive animals back into the wild. Uh, it's just too risky. There's too many pathogens and too many factors that would be, that could potentially wipe out everything. Um, my idea for uh, having a in situ facility in the highlands where so many uh, eggs are collected every year and raised up um, in the mountain at a, at a facility. Uh, that way the babies are raised up to a certain age. So that way they're past the easy pickings uh, phase and then released uh, in their nesting areas or the, where they were born. Um, and then also on a captive side where we're able to establish animals um, from portions of those animals collected uh, and reproduced in captivity for other uh, zoological facilities, private facilities, individuals and such. Uh, so that way we ultimately alleviate any pressure from the wild over collecting and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, having an in-situ facility would be fant fantastic to be able to uh, uh, collect eggs from animals uh, without affecting it, letting animals hatch in the wild and pulling so many animals and, and raising them up and then re-releasing them out there and stuff like that. But it would be in situ. So it would not be taking out of country uh, into the U S and then brought back over there and just be, it's just not safe to do it that way. Do you find that that, is that a hard thing to set up as far as if you had a facility to where you could have enough supply to satiate, you know, our needs over here as well as reintroduce you think that's ever something that can work and coexist as far as breeding technically, I guess, for our hobby over here and then conserving and keeping them in the wild? Yeah. I, to be honest with you, the, the hardest part of the whole process is, is getting the funding uh, to do it. Uh, and, and a lot of it, too, is being in the zoo community. Um, <clears throat> a lot of funding is based towards just individuals and organizations that are already pre-established. Uh, people like myself, uh, there's not a lot there. They're not not a lot there for. Um, all of my funding and research is uh, organized through me and private individuals, donations, um, selling art, uh, T-shirts, stuff like that to be able to fund me to continue to go out there, uh, pay uh, the local people that I'm working with, establish everything that I need to do. Uh, so that's the hardest part is being able to, to fund certain things like that. But uh, I mean, it, the last few years, it's been incredible, uh, which is some of the people that have been get, getting involved. But I mean, obviously, it, uh, to be able to do something to that level where it would be able to benefit um, captivity also uh, is another it's a different ball game. But it, it, it's definitely in the future. And I, I really hope 
that it presents itself soon. Uh, I just need somebody to be like, okay, yeah, how much do you need? All right, let's build it. You know, and, and that's the easy part. I think, um, I mean, it seems like something that you could sustain easily as far as financially, as far as getting $2,000 for a baby or something or $1,500 to send it over to the States and something that we know is captive born. And I just, I just don't, I guess it would just be having people um, work together. I mean, as far as people are always looking to ban something or make it totally legal as far as um i read this book about nonprofits and um one of the biggest conservation organizations was able to make the most leeway by working with you know corporations like mcdonald's and shit like that to okay. make all 100 percent you know renewable waste or whatever it is so as far as like nonprofits or conservation organizations don't like to work with the actual economic need they want to say hey don't buy any um Bolin's pythons so yeah. how can you how do you feel like you can work to bridge that gap um it's tough um because we i mean we need that entity as well at this point um i i've been fortunate enough i've had you know uh, frederick auctioned off a couple babies for research money for me which was pretty incredible um but um we need to have we need to have that outside source still providing, I think at this point, because we're not at the, we're not at the point to say, okay, we're done, you know? Um, and I think by doing something that's in country there would allow the means to continue it to an extent, if that makes sense. And it's kind of crazy to think about that you're doing a lot of this pretty much on your own accord. So, I mean, what can every it's individual, it. like any any individual out there, like what can we all do as keepers to help your cause or create our own cause and, you know, help conservation? So, like I said, like 90% of this comes out of my own pocket. Um, so, I mean, I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars just going out there and establishing these relationships with these people, you know, so I'm not just the crazy white guy that keeps coming out looking for these snakes. I'm somebody that, Oh, he's out here because he wants to do this. He's doing this and this, and they still think I'm crazy, but you know, they're there to help me because now I'm a part of the family. Um, so by having people make donations, uh, purchase shirts, uh, getting involved in, in, in any way they can, you know, say, Oh, Hey, I know somebody that's uh, in the travel age uh, is a travel agent over there. Hey, uh, I, you know, I could help you out with getting tickets uh, for, for this time of year, for this time of year, if that would help you out, you know, I, I can do, I mean, littlest things like that. Any little thing helps. Um, obviously money helps more because I can, it goes a long way because I can pass it to this person, pass it to that one. But, um, but like I said, I mean, 90% of it comes out of my own pocket. And then the other percent is, me sourcing, you know, private individuals doing fundraisers and, and uh, uh, you know, selling pieces of New Guinea art and utilizing that for uh, for funding money and, and stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, it's a lot of work and it's it's frustrating a lot of times because I hate asking people for money, but uh, it's a worthy cause. Um, I've been going there for over ten years now, and uh, it's uh, not going to stop tomorrow. There's still, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface of what's there. Um, and, and what can be learned, uh, from what we've, and from what I've brought back, I feel, you know, really confident in saying that just from these trips I've been taking and having conversations with people like yourself and, you know, uh, some of these people on these forums that I've been going to and, and other individuals that I just meet at shows like, um, that, that the information I'm bringing back has just really helped people push forward, uh, have an outlet to people to talk to about it or just a place for questions or, you know, come up with ideas to do their own kind of conservation work. Um, so it's not just seen as a zoo functioned event, you know, or a zoo focus. It, it can be anybody that has the, the passion to do it or has the interest to do it. Now does the zoological community, um, 
support you as far as getting your research out there? Do you get to talk to, you know, different herpetologists or anything in order to bounce your research off anyone or publish any papers? I mean, what do you do with the research after you collect it? um, I I speak with everybody and anybody I can. Um, The, the zoo field that I'm in is obviously supportive of my work. I'm not, they don't um, fund any of it or assist with any of it, but they're happy that I do it obviously. Um, So that's where, you know, a lot of the funding I have to find myself, but um, I, uh, I, I love talking to people that, that have spent time over in New Guinea and such like, you know, O'Shea, you know, was one of the people that I, that I like to talk to about stuff like that and, uh, just the environment and everything. Uh, but as far as like captive husbandry and stuff, like some of these people aren't animal keepers, you know, they're, they're herpetologists, they're scientists that go out there to observe things. And, and I, I try to use that for what I can, but, um, I try to talk to everybody I can and, and, uh, meet some incredible people that, that, you know, bounce ideas off me and you know we do the same back and forth you know grab a beer and talk you know they could be an amphibian keeper and you know they say hey i've noticed that you know if you do this la 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 la, you know this might help you know or something like that with uh you know lizards or turtles and tortoises so yeah i mean we've had plenty of talks of people to where we say you know everything crosses over whether i could be you could be listening about something about an auto mechanic and you may be like oh i never thought of uh doing my snakes something that you can always take something from somewhere else exactly so i mean i think that that's super cool as far as uh you know an open mind on all fronts i mean that's what's going to help us at the end get to a sustainable level now there's there's a lot of people out there especially younger people who say hey i want to get into you know the zoological field or i want to do research stuff like that i mean how would you steer someone into getting into something, you know, like you're doing? Um, I would, I would definitely tell them to pursue it as far as they want to. Um, <clears throat> conservation is fantastic. Getting into the zoo community is fantastic. You know, don't let anything come in your way. Um, if it's something you're passionate about or something that you, that you want to get involved with, do it. Uh, there shouldn't be anything that should stop you. Uh, get involved with local, you know, communities that are doing work. Herps, uh, herp groups, herp societies, um, big, um, uh, big reptile events, reptile shows. I mean, they're great avenues to meet people and, and, uh, and talk about what we all love doing and, and, and just that give you a better idea of what you're looking to, to achieve. But, but in the process, you're meeting people, you're connecting, you're gaining knowledge um, and experiences. And do you think that you have to you know, have a background, a college background to be respected in the space right now, or can you make uh, your own place? Uh, my formal degree is in animation, <laughs> but I've been, <laughs> uh, I've been in the zoo field for nine years. I've been working with reptiles for over 20. Um, yeah. And uh, I think what gets you respected is, <clears throat> is going to these events, getting involved in people taking notice of, Hey, there's that person, there's that guy, there's that, that girl, you know, they keep coming here. They keep talking, you know, they keep getting involved with what's going on. They keep asking questions. They want to do this. They want to do that. That's what really helps. Um, you can be the weirdest fucking person in the world, but if somebody sees that you're passionate about something like that, I mean, that speaks volumes, you know, uh, and, and, and a lot of people are afraid to approach people at these events and, 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 I love it when people come up to me and say, oh, I, I read your Bones book or, oh, I saw your, your Bones post. Man, it was so cool or, oh, it's so neat. And it's, it's so flattering. It's, it's like totally intimidating to me when they come up because it's like so flattering. But you've got to talk to people and people – that's how that's how you're going to push forward with, with things like that. And, and you're going to be surprised on some of these people you meet that are just incredible. I've met some amazing people by doing that. Absolutely. And I've met too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean that's just people in general. But yeah, I, I always – I'm always so jealous of like, I read about um, Vin Russo naming the Longicata as far as he was working with PhDs, you know, doing BOA research and he's just a guy. And yep. then there's, um, you know, director of herpetology for the Bronx Zoo in the late 1800s, early 90s, Raymond Dittmars. He didn't have any formal, he <laughs> ended up getting some college to give him an honorary PhD so that when he published shit for the zoo he could say dr dipmars but he wasn't actually a phd yeah. but yeah, I mean, he is I've like one of the i've met people that that have come straight out of academia 
that couldn't tell you how to set up a water dragon, you know, but, and I've met people that, you know, that are in private sectors that, you know, that are some of the most capable and incredible private keepers I've ever met. It's just, it's different. I, I, you don't need to have, in my opinion, you don't need to have a degree to be respected at all. You just need to have the same passion that we all do. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. That kind of brings me back to something else as far as Kevin McCurley doesn't have a high school diploma, but I did see him looking for Bowen's Python. So I think he's in the Bowen's game now. <laughs> yeah. He, have you, he, have you talked to him? Uh, we haven't, we, I spoke to him a long, long, long time ago. I don't know if he remembers me back then. Um, and, uh, I was just, a, I was just a younger kid. Obviously I feel old now, but, uh, and I don't know if he remembers when I spoke to him about Bowen's Python's, but, uh, I noticed he's been in my group, this group I have on Facebook, and he's been kind of the lurker. And lately he's popped out on, on some of it, which is interesting because a lot of people have taken notice to trying to do the bowling stuff and have been watching and all that. And I mean, I, I think it's great <clears throat> that we're getting these people that are that are that have been around for a long time that are trying to get involved because they hold um, – uh, knowledge from working with so many different taxa that could prove very beneficial for what we're doing or an observation that we're not seeing that, you know, they would pick up on that somebody that would work with something else would. Yeah. I mean, that's someone with a breadth of, you know, experience ranging from all lizards and, you know, snakes and everything in general. I mean, it's super interesting, but how many people are working with adult animals at this point that, you know, that may be going this year? Um, there's probably about a, I'd say there's probably close to maybe eight to 10 people that have adults that are probably ready. That's in the States. Yeah. That's ready to go to the States. There's, uh, there's more, there's over a hundred animals I'm sure in the U S right now, but uh, mature animals, I'd say it's probably about eight or nine people. Yeah. Probably about eight or nine people that have animals that are mature enough to start that are doing things with. Um, yeah. So have you found as far as um, when you're raising those babies, I know you say that they're more hardy, but are they susceptible to anything? They're susceptible to anything any other baby snake is. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, things that uh, affect keepers with, with Bolins is the fact that it's a Bolins and they're terrified of it uh, because of the stories. But they're very easy to maintain if you follow a specific regimen for them. And that's that's it. Um, but, uh, a lot of people are very intimidated by them, obviously because they're very expensive. So that's one big thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's it, a lot of people are afraid of them. I mean, it's definitely not a good investment as far as uh, how long do you think that these things take to mature? Uh, that's a question. I don't really know. Uh, I've seen follicle development in a four and a half year old female. Um, and, but I don't know. And I found a female in the wild that was six feet, uh, and she was sitting on eggs. So, um, I don't really know what sexual maturity is captive animals versus wild. It's a whole, like a whole other ball game. Uh, like I said, there's so many different things we're still learning. Is there any way to, um, I know, you know, some of my Morelia in captivity, you can kind of see when they're a little bit older, they kind of have a little bit different of a head to where if I saw a small carpet that's a little bit older in age, I may be able to tell it apart from a carpet the same age, about the same size. So you're talking about a six foot animal. You think that six foot animal could be a lot older than what we keep in captivity just because of feeding rates and yeah, stuff like exactly. that? Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, it's it could be like 10 years old and it's only six feet, you know. Uh, it's just so it's, it's so weird. Captivity versus the wild is so different. Um, and I think that's going to be a big factor as far as helping the success is trying to get it animals, uh, to look more like the wild animals and not be in a rush. I think every, everybody wants to be in a rush to breed them because they want to be like one of the first or whatever. It, it's, it's an ego thing with, with Bolin's pythons. It's always been with everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, um, so, uh, you're not going to be a millionaire selling Bolin's pythons. It's not like that. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a different game with these. Uh, I was talking Snake to Snake glory. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I was talking to my friend Keith the other day and I said, man, I've, I've come to this realization that if you keep Bolins, you just have to keep Bolins. You can't keep anything else. And he's like, yeah, he goes, yeah, you're right. He goes, uh, you, you can't maintain Bolins successfully with other animals if you're going to do it right. 
because they require so specific things as they start getting older or what you're trying to do that it becomes difficult. You, I mean, they take up all the time and, and everything to do it right, in my opinion. And some people will disagree, but whatever. <laughs> do you do you think that captive generation after captive generation it will become easier to keep and easier to breed? I hope so. I hope so. I hope that we'll um, be able to kind of uh, understand what the factors are for success more. We will probably never know exactly what it is, but we'll have a better idea. <clears throat> and that'll prove to be a little bit more successful for certain people or, or for us for keeping it. Um, that's, that would be wonderful. Um, but uh, I think we'll, as time goes, I think we'll start kind of understanding a little bit more in the, and animals, you know, obviously if we've got, if it'd be very interesting to see, uh, cause some of Frederick's animals are in the U S right now at my friend Evan's uh, facility. Uh, and it'd be, it'll be very interesting to see when those animals are mature. Cause those are actually captive bred animals. Uh, what it's like for them to reproduce, uh, if they require as much specific, you know, uh, stimuli as, as working with, you know, non-captive produced animals. Uh, so it should be exciting. Are there people in Europe working with Frederick's animals straight up as far as animals that haven't been put through the importation process? Because we yeah. still have a long haul importing them over here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, there's uh, several uh, people have Frederick's animals over there um, and they're raising them up also. Um, and uh, and then like in the U.S. too. Um, yeah, I, I imported uh, Frederick's animals in for the, a friend of mine. Uh, that he put into his group. I think he had six or seven of his babies that he brought in. So the, it should be very interesting to see what they do when they're mature. I think more importantly, does Frederick have his own, have a pair of his own, you know, F1s to make sure that, you know, we have a control group if he's just he the snake I whisperer? Keep, or... Yeah, he doesn't. I keep giving him shit about it. So uh, he said, maybe I'll hold back some babies this year. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean because he could have the magic pair or he could have the magic solution or he can you know you don't really know unless he does it over time with different animals exactly so he's got he's got uh two pairs that are that were his uh parents animals that he's done all his reproduction with so far so he's had two separate pairs and now he just added another adult pair uh that were long-term animals that were raised from babies that should be interesting to see what they do this season Oh, so he may have unrelated pairs that he can keep back. Yeah, and, and we have a we have a plan uh, between a couple of us. If we're successful this year, we're going to try to pull animals from uh, certain clutches and swap with other individuals to kind of raise up to establish uh, different genetics if we can, uh, with and you know just with with hopes of having some different lineage animals in the future. So that's the plan. So. I think that's real interesting as far as, you know, that's something that captive breeders don't take into account as much as say, you know, zoos have breeding projects where you have yeah. unrelated pairs going everywhere and keeping track yeah, of them. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with, with my zoo experience is try to incorporate that professional aspect of the zookeeping to um, of the private sector. So um we we're hoping to you know if we like i said if we are successful with a couple of us being able to reproduce, reproduce this year we'll we'll swap animals out so that way they're with individuals and eventually trying to make uh some kind of um uh ssp or like species survival plan uh where certain um uh animals will be sent off to different individuals you know obviously there'll be you know guidelines and everything like that so we're working on that we're working on a an app and a program to, to do that track lineage and all that stuff. So got a lot of exciting things, hopefully to try to do in the next few years, not, not just the wild stuff. So. So has there been any activity, whether it be you or Keith McPeak this year so far? Uh, I have not paired my animals up yet. I'm still cycling. Keith uh, mentioned to me today that his animals were starting to, spend more time around each other, which is cool. Uh, I've got another friend uh, in California, uh, James, uh, and I saw he paired his guys up a little early and he's already got copulation and stuff like that. I mean, copulation is super easy, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and I'm sure there's a couple other people that just haven't made it public yet. Um, but um, yeah, so I, like I said, it's this year's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. We, we've got 
we have the the makings of a really exciting year if it plans out. So you think as far as, I mean, Bolin, it seems to me that you guys are much more controlled and calculated and are working together much better than, you know, there's no seems like Hal Mahara scrub group out there trying this hard. Yeah, I mean, Helms are, I, I worked with Helms for a while uh, and they're super interesting. I just didn't, I couldn't work, I couldn't do 110% for Bolin's when I had my Helms. Uh, so I ended up selling my Helms a couple years ago, uh, but they were super cool. And, uh, <clears throat> but they're, they're just so uh, different um, in the hobby, I guess. It's just more of a niche. Uh, to, to keep so but yeah the the collaboration with a lot of uh groups is is just lacking of so that's what i've been trying to do for the last 10 years is to establish a positive community where people can share they can communicate without having any kind of ridicule there's no bs involved there's no arguments and everything like that and if there is it's just like all right you're done you know uh where it's just a, a positive environment that we can all work from so uh we had a big meeting uh, at Tinley this year where we had some of the um, some of the bigger names that are working with Bolins uh, in the community I'm involved in. And we all kind of sat around. Frederick came out, too, from Sweden, and uh, Quetzal from Costa Rica was there. Um, and uh, we kind of came up with some ideas and, and talked a little bit about uh, some plans and things that we're trying to do and try to incorporate for the next couple of years. So that should be cool. <laughs> Do you think there's any validity as far as um, they're in Somalia, in air quotes, if people can't see that, just like scrubs, and scrubs happen to be some of the hardest animals to breed in captivity for us. Is it a location thing? Is it a genus thing? You know, they may have similarities. I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I know scrubs are very difficult still to reproduce. Um, And... uh, I think it'll, I I think over time, hopefully it will open up uh, more windows and and opportunity to, um, to have more successes with some of the more difficult species. And now I've seen both areas of the spectrum as far as, um, do you find Bolins to be a laid back species or are they attentive and defensive kind of like scrub pythons? Um, They're very observant and they're very, um, they're very observant and they're very attuned with their environment. That's probably the best way to do it, <clears throat> to, to say it. Um, and they're, uh, they're just, they're v- very observant. That That's the thing. Uh, they watch a lot. Um, they, they just behave differently. It's just, it's, it's hard to describe. Um, they're a different animal. Awesome. So we are approaching two hours right now. Is there anything you would want to uh, get out there for everyone? Um, just, you know, um, don't be, if you're involved with, uh, the group already that, that I'm doing on Facebook, you know, just don't be afraid to ask people questions. Um, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're here to help and answer anything you have. Uh, and if it's for, you know, if, if you're looking to get in conservation work or anything with zoos, just, you know, push forward to it. I mean, it's not, you know, life's too short. Don't, don't waste it on an opportunity that you could have had, um, I'm certainly glad I didn't because I wouldn't be in this position I am now where I'm be able to go to these places and travel and, and, and research this animal, you know? Um, and, and if you're, and if you're listening and you're wanting to get involved with my work, you know, please donate, uh, and everything helps. Um, you know, I'm, I'm easily able to be reached on Facebook or messenger. Uh, if you're wanting to talk privately with stuff like that to help out with my, my research and my cause, if you want to buy shirts, go for it. Uh, I mean, anything helps and it, everything means uh, so much uh, because it uh, it keeps me doing what I'm doing and keeps me coming back and talking to you guys and, and helping out. And, and, and thank you uh, again for having me on. It was, it was a lot of fun, despite okay. my dogs making out of the background <laughs> and the collars going. And... I can edit that stuff out. Cool. But um, uh, there's one thing that just popped into my head as far as um... – I saw on Facebook, I like talking about all ranges as far as this is all you're pumped up about (laughs) Bolin's talk so far, but I saw on Facebook maybe a couple years ago or so where you were like, "Ah, I think I'm done with Bolin's or something along those lines. Can you explain to me your low point with Bolin's and how you got out of that? 
man. You know um, what I'm talking about, first of all? I, I don't remember. <laughs> but it probably was associated with just a bunch of idiots. And there's a bunch of idiots wherever you go. And I think it got to the point where um, it, what it was was uh, I think my age – I mean, I'm, I'm 38 now. I don't feel like it, but I know I'm getting old. And I think um, I've always been actively involved in herpetoculture and herpetology. And I've always been that nerdy kid that has ran up to that person to get an autograph and tell them something I read in their book that I thought was awesome. Or I saw them on TV and I thought it was so cool. And I, I think I was for a while when I was showing so much interest and passion and, and push and drive, I was seen as a threat to some of the older um uh, uh, herpers that had been in the community for forever. Uh, and I think at that point it was like, uh, I was being faced with ridicule for, um, you know, kind of the, who are you kind of routine, you pay your dues kind of thing. And, uh, and it's like, you know what, I've come to the realization now, you know what, motherfuckers, <laughs> who else has gone into <laughs> gay 14 times or whatever, you know, I'm in these mountains, I have slipped, I have fallen, I have shit my pants. I have, you know, fought them off. I have dodged the arrows. You know, I have paid my dues and you know what? Deal with it. That's the best way to do it. And I'm not going anywhere. And I'm here to share my passion of what I love and talk to everybody I can about why I love it so much. And uh, that's just who I am. And, you know, it's taken a long time for me to deal with that. But um, I was put on this planet you know to do this with these animals and that i'm just a firm believer of that that is uh why i am here to to help you know help everybody out and help these snakes and uh so with that being said you know pretty much it i guess <laughs> that is an awesome way to end the podcast yes so ari thank you so much for being on no and problem. for I mean, you guys should feel fucking, I'm lucky just to have, you know, the most, the person who's done probably the most research out of anyone in the fucking world on Bolin's pythons, as far as oh, thank you. you've been face in the dirt doing research, oh. you know, legit, your hands yeah. are getting dirty doing the research and you're out there and no one can take that away from you. And thank you so much for coming on and reward him by helping him out and getting to uh, New Guinea again. And uh, if you guys want to reach me, I'm at Port City Pythons everywhere, YouTube, Instagram. You probably know. If you listen this far in the podcast, you probably know who we are. But uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will talk to you guys next week. Cool. Uh, thank you, guys. Also, you can check out projectblackpython.org. Uh, got all my updated research up on there. I've got videos. I've got husbandry stuff. I've got some really crazy you know, photographs from over there, all sorts of stuff. And uh, – and thanks again for having me. It's awesome. Uh, just means a lot. Awesome. You heard it, guys. Visit it, you filthy animals. We'll see you later.